for discuss Man United's challenges to put them uh, lightly. We'll talk some underdogs, Girona, Villa, and, and others in some big leagues, Leverkusen, and they're still top of the table. Will they be able to finish up there? And then we'll get to some transfers right now. We're only a couple weeks away from the win- January window opening. What would be a really good fit? Giannis, before you and I kind of dive into it, we'll start with the ESPN FC guys talking about what was the 1-0 loss yesterday for Man United and them finishing bottom of the group and being out of Europe. Out of everything in Europe, they finished bottom of the group. Uh, Bayern Munich winning by one goal to nil. Uh, Bayern confirmed then we knew they were going to be top of the group anyway. Elsewhere, Copenhagen uh, with that 1-0 win over Galatasaray sees them qualified second and they'll be in Friday's draw. Uh, Mark Ogden is with us with the dodgy internet, so this could be fun. Uh, Jan Agafjortov uh, with us as well. Uh, Craig, that was a great 90 minutes. Oh, I, mean, I, I have to be honest, I just loved it. All the games up there on the screen was just so exciting, you know. Final, final day at the office in the Champions League. I think, really, there is some congratulations in order here, if we go the other way, because it's, it's actually quite an achievement for Manchester United to finish bottom of that group. Right. Trust me. There is some achievement to finish bottom of that group. Bayern Munich, by the way, have struggled a little bit in Germany. Yeah. They're not the they lost 5-1 at the weekend. That's quite Hammered by Eintracht Frankfurt. Galatasaray... I've got no recent history in the Champions League. And Copenhagen, you know, they're a workman light side, but, you know, the budget's very small in comparison. And yet they finish bottom of the group, having lost the most amount of goals by any English team ever in the group stages. I mean... There's nothing else to say, but it was unexpected, and it's an embarrassment. Uh, Ten Hag said they didn't deserve to lose. Oh, well. Eric, you, you're not helping yourself, Eric. <laughs> Look, and, and the stats will tell you a story, but I think if you just want to focus on something, this was a match that Manchester United needed to win, regardless of what happened at Copenhagen. Manchester United needed to give themselves a chance, an opportunity to win. In order to do that, early on in the match, I was expecting, I don't know why, but I was expecting that Manchester United were going to come out and we're going to contest and we're going to compete and challenge 50-50 balls and win duels so that at the very least you get all Trafford behind you, believing that this was possible. And what did we see from Manchester United? Watching Bayern Munich play and have possession of the ball. It's almost as if this team has already accepted their fate. Yeah. That they are resigned to the fact they're a bad team. They've accepted it. And now you're just going through the motions. And yes, you run around and you put some endeavor, just enough to get through, but, but not enough to challenge anybody in particular. In that quote, post-game, he also said that the team showed spirit. I watched Manchester United play. And there is no spirit. There is no soul. There is no life in this team. There is no sparkle. There is no fire. There is nothing. There is an acceptance of being a bad team. And once the players accept that, and the manager seems to be accepting that as well, even though he may say something differently, and the fans themselves, they've accepted it as well. They're resigned to the realities of Manchester United. There's nowhere to go here. Nowhere to go, nowhere to turn. Manchester United, simply put, they're a bad team without any sort of soul, without any sort of spirit without any fire. Uh, Ali Moreno not mincing words. Craig Burley not there either. Uh, Giannis, do you concur? Is this, is this basically a, a team that is, is rudderless and a little bit lifeless? Or do you see a heartbeat in here? Like, what, what do you see when you look at not just United's performance yesterday, but kind of in the grand scheme of things? Well, I mean, part of it, of course, a lot of it is true, and we've we've been talking about it uh, for a while now. But uh, I think, you know, and, and this is a little bit of a hindsight, but, I mean, it's been coming, and it's been coming for years. So uh, I, I suppose to a degree uh, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, this is Manchester, but, but it's not United, right? I mean, this is a Manchester that's living in the past. The present is what we see right now. Uh, and the future uh, is not looking good because you can't fix these things overnight. You can put a Band-Aid on certain things, but certain things uh, you, you can hide. And, you know, I look at this and, yeah, we can talk about this game. Uh, but, you know, I mean, they've had the opportunities. This is a team that scored 12 goals. That's as many goals as Bayern Munich have scored. The problem is defensively, right? They've, they've conceded 15. This is also a team that had two goal leads against uh, Copenhagen and uh, Galatasaray. So, I mean... 
I'm not saying this would have been a different team, but they've had plenty of opportunities. I just think that maybe there is some truth to the fact that they understand that they're not good, and but they understand also that this team is not put together in a way that it should be, right? Because Eric Ten Hag, as you all know, doesn't play like this. This is supposed to be a, a pressing team. This is supposed to be a team that possesses the ball, and it isn't. But part of the problem is, you know, how do you build a team? And as I said before, do the players want to come? Look, for years we've been talking about Real Madrid and Manchester United as the top two biggest teams in the world. And we talk about financially and trophies and this, that, or the other, right? And I, I'm still pretty sure it's that way. I don't know if it's one and two or one and three, whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? But but look at the reaction of Real Madrid when they had to rebuild. Who'd they get rid of? Casemiro? Casemiro. Varane? Right, even Sergio Ramos, who isn't in Manchester United, but I somehow think that if he was available, Manchester United probably would have taken him. Ericsson conceding goals, uh, I, you know, those are the players. Amrabat, even I mean, Johnny Evans is coming into the lineup. You can sit here and tell me all you want about Maguire, he's not getting better. This is as good as it gets, and it's average, nothing more, nothing more. It's not going to change. So, I think when you build that, that team, and th this team has been built like that emergency buys and players that kind of come maybe for a paycheck, but not to win the trophies. Because if you ask them honestly, they'd say, they look around the dressing room and they, they say, it's impossible to compete with the best teams in the world with this. It just isn't. I mean, there's a lot of injuries and some of it you can foresee, as I mentioned, some of it is age, some of it is maybe, maybe not dealing with the team properly. I don't look Shaw. I mean, how shocked are we after such a long time where he's come in and played, I don't know, two or three games in 10 days or even less than that? Are we surprised that he's he's broken down? So you look at this team and you look at somebody like Anthony. Uh, he's got what, one assist mm -hmm. the entire yeah. season so far? Not one goal. How many? 70, 80 million? I don't even remember, right? Garnacho, okay, great goal. But I look at the two wings and I look at this youngster who probably should be learning from the best right now. I'm talking about Rasmus Hoyland, uh, who has got 10, 15 touches less than his goalkeeper, but no service because Anthony and Garnacho, by the way, who works hard, I got to give him that, but they play for themselves. They didn't play for the team. And you can go on and on by every position. As I've mentioned, you look at McTominay, who's not supposed to even be on that team, if we believe mm -hmm. a people ahead of the season, is looking like Ronaldo right now. But that in itself is not good either. So there's all kinds of issues with this team. And, and, and you almost have to blow this up because... You know, there's so much pressure on massive clubs to turn around. And sometimes it does happen. But obviously, looking at the last two or three or four coaches who haven't gotten right, I mean, you tell me who's going to come in and change that overnight. So nothing's going to change right now, at least not until, obviously, Jim, uh, Ratcliffe, uh, Sir Jim uh, Ratcliffe comes in, because that would be even crazier story if they pulled the trigger on him, unless they quietly spoken to him. Uh, you know, that I don't know, of course. Uh, and nothing's going to change. And, and it shows. Arsenal took him a little bit. And and as we know, a couple of eighth place uh, uh you know, seasons. And mm -hmm. then, you know, they kind of grew and finished fifth. And now we see that, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're about, but it takes time. But Manchester United want to change it overnight without really thinking it through and having, having an idea on how to rebuild and think progressively and ahead of time. You mentioned a couple, just a comp comparison to Real Madrid, that they were going through financial issues and trying to rebuild, but they cut bait with some players that have been around for a while. They also, whether it's investment in players or development of players, like you've got Vinicius Jr., Rodrigo, others that, that are playing on it, that are better than, than anybody on United's team by, by leaps and bounds. You also mentioned Arsenal in the mix, though, too, in terms of their pre their their mid-table finishes or for their, for, for and I'm a fan, anybody who watches the show probably knows that by now, I'm a Gunner supporter, that they were, they were struggling, but it's also... And understanding if they were trying to put people in place, when you look back on it, to try to run this thing. Adu comes in. What's your vision? What's the process? How does this work? Okay, the Cronkies are getting crushed. Josh moves over to London, and he's going to invest more. They're going to invest more. They're going to try to do something organizationally. Where I make that comparison is they were less concerned about the financial piece of things in terms of making money and the economics of it. United is a money-making machine. As you noted, it is, along with Real Madrid, it's one of the biggest clubs in the world, and they kind of oscillate, and sometimes Barcelona's been there. I mean, you look at the Forbes list the last 10 years, it's one of the most biggest brands in the world, the most valuable, and it's still making money. The commercial needs and desires have outweighed the football ways, needs and desires for years. That's why you bring back Ronaldo in the first place. There, there weren't many football justifications for it. He did score a lot of goals. We get that. But you saw the meltdown that everybody kind of knew was coming based on father time. 
my, my concern is when you look at the, the totality of it, the commercial piece is still so important to them and drives decision making. There's an absence of leadership. There is void of leadership. And you just mentioned, when does Radcliffe come in? When do you have a director of football? When do you when do you actually let the football lead on what we should be doing? And who in the suits is going to talk to and is going to get the who they believe is the right coach and start to put this thing together? And it's not going to happen overnight. But you think you have Ten Hag, and this poor guy is floundering. And sometimes his own volition of whether he's starting Johnny Evans ahead of Iran in, in in you know the last few months, or you got different other examples from a, you mentioned Anthony's got was his guy. He's been terrible, and it cost him like eighty million dollars or something like that. Like it's been. A, a debacle at every level. And what I wonder is when you have a void of leadership, when the interests aren't the football, can still lead the way in the boardroom, how do you square that circle? And how long is it going to take? And who is the right person to come in there to take this job? Because you're going to get hammered at some point. But at some point, you have to have a vision from the top, communicate it down, have a manager that sees it, and you're going to invest in it. And then you eventually will execute against it. And we're seeing an arsenal plan in year basically three and change of that. And they're finally now competing for the title like we think they should. United might have to go through the same process, Janish, but I just don't know who the pieces are, like when the pieces of the top get organized to even worry about the actual product on the field. They're still going to play games, and it's going to be a disaster for the rest of the year. I don't know how it changes. You've got to stop, you know, first and foremost, you have to stop trying to cut the corners and, you know, in in hopes that overnight by buying a one or two players, you're going to fix a a long term project. And this is exactly what it's been. And it's been a long, long time since Sir Alex Ferguson left. It was 2012 or 2013. So that's first and foremost. If you Glazers, of course, they take a lot of money out of the club. They've invested a lot of money. Obviously, the investment hasn't been good because there's no leadership in terms of that, that vision. That's a hard part. I mean, I don't want to hammer United just for that because we've seen it. It's not easy to get somebody uh, like uh, Sir Alex Ferguson was, like mm-hmm. Arsene Wenger were, where they had a, a finger on everything that goes on in the club. And maybe to a degree in the end, that wasn't the right thing to do. But certainly you have to have the leaders and you have to find a manager who sees this as an opportunity. Because right now it's easy to say, well, which players will want to come to the club? Not many. Not the best players in the world. United is no longer that club because all the players are looking at it and they see other options that are better. The best players in the world, Manchester United has always been one of the biggest options, but it isn't right now. So that may be second, third or fourth, the sort of players that we see right now. Uh, but, you know, you first and foremost, you have to find now a leader that sees an opportunity in this chaos because there are people, you mm-hmm. know, I always say when there's chaos, there's an opportunity. And you know what? If I were a manager, if I were younger, and I'd say to myself, look at this mess that Manchester United are. The first person that gets this right is going to be a legend forever. And that's where you have to you have to find a visionary that's going to find a time, that's going to be able to convince the ownership, whoever the director of coaching is going to be, because that's first and foremost, obviously, uh, that's going to be able to convince them that there is a way, but it's going to have to be a more patient way, not not the way uh, United are trying to cut the corner corners. You essentially mentioned chaos and opportunity. I mean, Churchill's famous quote, never, never let a good crisis go to waste. So mm-hmm. you, there, there is an opportunity there. We'll see how, if, if somebody comes in there. Just real quick on the winter transfer window, when you have this lack of vision, but there still is a talent gap. They have a lack of talent and quality players. How, if at all, they attack this window, given that you probably have a, a lame duck manager, but you need to get better players into your club? Well, I mean, it's going to be difficult because they're going to have to sell. Uh, and they're okay. desperate right now, and everybody knows it. And and it, a, a lot of these players, because it was a stop gap, they were desperate themselves to get some of these players, right? When you look at, it's hindsight, but look at Anthony's of the world and some of the bigger names, they overpaid for what they de- are delivering. So in order to get real money uh, uh, for that, it's going to be very difficult. Everybody around the world knows that. So it's not going to be easy. But I'll tell you what, the thing, the thing, the worst thing about United is that if you have given some of these players an opportunity to run right now, they would. Yeah, they and definitely and would. I'll tell and I'll tell you what and and if and who has true value? Who are the players that you're going to get right now? And those are the hard decisions. I'm not even talking about January. Uh, I mean, that's probably too soon to make it happen because it, yeah. it, it's going to be massive. But you know. I think they they seriously need to consider letting Bruno go because you're going to get some for him. I mean, there is a team out there. He's talented enough. If you can kind of surround him with players that will do what he likes to do and won't complain in a way, at least it seems that way. Uh, he's still a very good player. 
unfortunately for him to be to be at the best level, he needs better players around him. And that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in January. It is what it is right now at Manchester United. And that's going to change much. But I would definitely consider because you can get value for that. You can get a lot of money and you can start the rebuilding process. So you know what? If you gave Bruno now an opportunity to go, this is my guess. I think he'd go.